My name is Bernhard Ecke, I'm a junior professor at FAU in Germany and today I would like to give you a tutorial about three morphological phase models. I would like to thank the two organizers and hosts today, Luis N. Hu and Teseo Schneider, and I would like to thank you very much for putting this nice program and for the grad school at the Symposium of Geometry Processing together and also for inviting me. So 3D morphological phase models are a pretty large topic and um, also historically grew quite a bit, so I can't possibly cover everything in today's presentation. So my goal of the presentation today is to give you a rough overview and to catch your interest. So you will see a lot of small things and um, behind a lot of those things there is a whole line of research and a lot of um, PhD students spend time on things that I might mention in one word or in one sentence. Um, so it really the purpose is to give you a rough overview and um, to catch your interest that if you feel like that could be something interesting for you that you could um, dig deeper. The presentation today is pre-recorded um, but at the end of the presentation I will join um, the virtual room um, to answer your questions that you might have. So let's start um, with a quick introduction of myself. Um, I did all my studies at the University of Basel in Switzerland. So I did my bachelor's there, I did my master's there both in computer science, and I also did my PhD there in the research group of um, Professor Thomas Vetter. During my master's, I already started to kind of work on 3D morphological models, um, but more on the shape modeling perspective. And the goal of my master's thesis was to try um, to understand the relation between skulls and faces. So given a dry skull, could we um, estimate how the face would look like? Or given a face, um, could we estimate how the underlying skull would look like? So one of them has a forensic application and the other one um, would have an application in animation if you would know how the bone structure um, would look below the skull. In my PhD, I then switched um, to 3D morphing models um, and to the analysis of faces from 2D images. And this is something I will heavily cover um, today in my presentation. Besides my um, education in computer science, I also did an upper secondary school teaching diploma, um, so I can teach computer science at high schools. So this was a little bit a, a sidetrack, um, but it's kind of my backup plan if this whole professor thing doesn't work out. After my PhD, I was then um, fortunate enough to get um, a fellowship from the Swiss National Science Foundation to go to the US, to go to Boston and to go to MIT. I first joined there um, Paulina Golland's, Professor Paulina Golland's group, and then um, moved to Josh Tenenbaum's lab, um, first at CCL and then at um, the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. At CCL with Professor Paulina Golland, I worked on the lateral ventricles in the human brain, um, and we were trying to predict the outcome of stroke patients from um, white matter hyperintensities um, that we observe in MR images. We, in particular, were using shape modeling tools and modeled the hyperintensities on the surface um, of the ventricles, as a feature on the surface of the ventricles. In Professor Josh Tenenbaum's lab, I then moved back to faces um, and explored several questions around 3D morphing models, more from a cognitive science or neuroscience um, perspective. For example, those black and white moony faces um, that you can see here on the left, Although it's very colorful faces, I will tell you something about those um, towards the end of the presentation. If I'm not doing research, I'm a passionate scuba diver and I also have a glider pilot license. So I'm very happy to also chat about that anytime um, you meet me in person or also virtually. Um, after all of that, I joined the Friedrich Alexander Universität in Erlangen Nuremberg, um, where I'm here as a junior professor. Um, we always say that's the best university you have never heard of. Um, you might not know the name yet, but I hope that you might remember it in future. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty big university with 40,000 students um, that covers all different directions of, of um, the, the scientific education. And we have a pretty strong um, technical department and you might know um, some of our alumni. So um, let's dig into the actual topic. If I show you a picture like this, it takes you some split seconds and you start to interpret um, this image. And this is one of my research goals, to understand scenes like this one here, 
um, and to use slightly different tools than what most of the computer vision community is doing. I would like to get a rich understanding of that image. I would like to reconstruct the 3D scene um, from such a single image. I know I, with 3D Morph Mods, I will present one tool to you how we can um, enable that. If you look at this image, you might have seen that image before. Um, if you wouldn't have seen it before, you would immediately start to interpret it. You would be in particular interested, be interested about the faces. Um, you would probably also estimate where those people are gazing at. Um, and you would assume there might be something outside of the picture. So you might even reason about things that you can't actually see in the picture. Um, and if you look a little bit longer, you potentially also realize that somebody is not paying attention. And this works much better in a, in a real presentation where you have an audience because there is always this one person who doesn't pay attention in a real audience. But he might also be steering the presentation or writing a very important email or, or whatever. So we can't really blame him. Okay, um, if you throw such an image in current machine learning algorithms like detecting faces is kind of almost solved. Um, estimating the gaze is something you get and you could also segment all the objects in that image and you would probably get satisfying results. What currently doesn't work yet is I want, if I want to have a very rich scene description, if I want to know the interaction between those people, if I would like to have the 3D reconstruction. So what I'm basically looking at in my research, and I will show you that later, is the scene tree um, behind this photograph. So let's also dig into a slightly um, different motivation um, if you would like to manipulate face images. So if I show you two images like that, I could ask you which one is the real one and which one is the manipulated one. Um, but the question that I'm asking is slightly different. So those images are actually both manipulated and they are manipulated in a way that one of them should appear more trustworthy to you than the other one. And probably most of you would agree that you perceive the one on the left as more trustworthy than the one on the right. And the question is here, we can also change other factors like smiling um, or the size of the eyebrow or the size of the nose. Um, so the question here is how can we make such changes? Those are pretty subtle changes. The result is photorealistic. So how can we make such changes when what we get is a single um, 2D image? And the tools we are using are actually very similar then to analyze the picture that I've just shown you before. So what are the challenges if we would like to um, manipulate that image? And here I will use on the one side the 3D morphing model. So those are those synthetic faces that you see here on the bottom. Um, but I will also use a smiley model. So a 2D, very simplistic model um, to basically explain you all the math on a very um, easy level. Um, because I have no idea what everybody brings as a, as a backpack um, from the method side with you. And they would like that it's very inclusive, that everybody can understand and the basic concepts and some of you might get like how it works in detail um, but everybody should at least be able to understand and um, the, the basic ideas so the first thing we need to understand is where do we need to change stuff so what we need here is the concept of correspondence and i will explain that in detail then um, we need to know what to change so we need some statistics we need somehow a data set that tells us those are people that are smiling, those are people that are not smiling, and those are people that were rated as um, appearing trustworthy, and those are people that are rated as appearing not so trustworthy. And there are actually studies that show that those um, trustworthiness doesn't correlate with the, um, with the perceived trustworthiness, but that's a very different topic. So the last thing um, we have to think about is how do we apply that change? And for that, we can apply linear models, um, but we also can apply nonlinear models. In the methods that I show you today, um, we keep it simple. So we go um, for nonlinear with almost anything. Um, but of course, there, sorry, we go with linear for everything. Um, but of course, for almost anything, there are also nonlinear methods. So you will find a paper that does almost every single step that we are doing here linearly in a nonlinear fashion. What you see here on the left are 10 
um, faces that were released with the Basel face model, which was the first publicly available morphable face model. And then um, th th um, we can build a statistic model based on those. And what we would like to change is what you see on the right. So we have a face in some state and we would like to manipulate that face into another state. For example, here we would like to apply um, a smile. And the simplification we take here is a, is a smiley model, a 2D model, which is very simplistic. Um, it also has the coordinate grid in the background. That's just for orientation. And our model um, basically has just a few points. So it has two eyes, um, two points for the eyes. It has two points for the nose. And I think it has four points um, for the mouse. So this is a drastic simplification for the 3D morph model for faces. We have around 65,000 points. Um, so it's first of all much less points and the reason why we do that um, is smileys are fun and the other reason is it's, it makes it much easier um, to explain the concept, concepts because the underlying math of a 3D morphing model is actually um, pretty easy. So I will always try to um, show you that relation from um, this 2D smiley model to the 3D morphing model. So if we would like to um, do some calculations with those smileys, because at the end, this manipulation, we would like to apply this vector, we would like to apply to change a face um, is somehow a computation. So if we have um, the image on the left, the smiley on the left, and we would like to make the smiley smile, and um, we have to apply some change, we have to apply something. So the question is, what do we apply? And the other question is, what? What can possibly go wrong? So if we have the original image here, um, what we can do is we can say like, okay, we would like to add happiness. And then the question is, how do we measure happiness? So what we need is some kind of a data set. And in this simple case, we just have two images. We have um, the one on the left is one that's smiling very strongly. And the one on the right is one that's smiling much less. So we define happiness for this simple example, just as the one on the left is more happy than on the right, and there is nothing else different. So the difference between the smiley on the left here and the smiley on the right is what we define happiness. And we would like to apply this difference um, to the original image. So what could potentially go wrong if we do that? And what goes wrong is if we just do that on a pixel basis, uh, point by point, and um, we get something like this. And this looks very funny. Um, it's also kind of smiling, but it's not what we expected. So we have somehow ghosting artifacts around the eyes. We have two mouths. Um, it doesn't look quite like a smiley anymore. It looks like something. It looks funny, uh, but it's not what we were looking, what we were looking for. Um, so the problem we have with this calculation is that we didn't solve the correspondence problem. And correspondence is something that's really an underlying um, modeling technique for the 3D morphing model, and it's um, very important. And even a lot of the morphing models that are used today um, have this very strong assumption of correspondence. And I would now like to um, explain you what that correspondence means. And correspondence means that in each face, so in each 3D face and in each smiley, we have points that we can locate in all of them. So for example, in the smiley, it's the left eye. So one of the two blue eyes, the right eye, the other one, the nose, the corner of the mouse, somewhere in the middle of the mouse. And for each of those points, we have to find the point um, on the other smiley. And we do the exact same thing with, with 3D faces. So we search for the tip of the nose, we search for the corner of the eyes, we search for the corner of the mouth, and we do that for each of the 65,000 points. And that's what we call dense correspondence. So it's not only for some of the points on the faces, face, it's really for every point on every face, we find the corresponding point on all other faces. And that's a pretty strong assumption. It works pretty good in practice, um, but it's a very strong assumption. And there are also some cases where this assumption is, is pretty wrong, um, especially for modeling texture, or if you have some features where there is no correspondence. So there are some features that you can very easily imagine. So for example, faults, this nasolabial fold, 
um, is in some people stronger in others um, less strong but we could say like that to fold that we will find correspondence in a lot of people but what do we for example do with the wrinkles on the forehead like I have three or four other people have none some people have five or two um, so there is just no way to find the corresponding fold um, in another face for every of my folds. Um, the same also with small texture features. If I have a small hole, mole, um, you will not find the same mole in, in another person. So on the, on the texture, you also can't really, really find a lot of those correspondences. Or even with eyebrows, um, there is the additional problem that how do you define the correspondence? Do you define it on the shape or do you define it on the texture? And you will get a very different result. So here in the smiley model, everything is easy. In the 3D morph model, it's getting more and more tricky. Um, but what we do for the, for the following um, few slides and for simplicity is we just assume that this correspondence assumption is right, that we can assume that for every point in my face, we will find a corresponding point in every other face um, on the world. And that assumption makes everything much, 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 much easier. And that assumption um, enables us to use um, very simple math and very simple statistics um, to, to model. So on the 3D face, it looks like that. We find the point on the nose, we find the point on the corner of the mouse. And doing that on the 3D face is actually pretty tricky in practice. What we need to solve this correspondence problem um, is called registration. And registration is something that a lot of people spend their PhD with. So there are a lot of different techniques how to register one face with another face or another 3D thing with, with another 3D thing. So for example, bones or other body parts or cars or whatever. And the reason why um, this is so tricky um, is because it's a, it's a very um, non-convex optimization problem. And the, or, or one of the very tricky parts is that you assume the strict correspondence and it might just not be there all the time. So you need some, some good priors. And in some regions like the tip of the nose, it might be pretty easy to find the corresponding point or for the corner of the eye. But what do you do on the cheek? You need some kind of a smoothness assumption. You need to assume that on the cheek it's more smooth because you have very few um, features. And at the end, it's also very hard to, step, uh, to evaluate that correspondence because it's also very hard to label that by hand. Um, so the actual evaluation of this correspondence you get um, by a specific application. So after the correspondence, you can build a model and then you can apply the model and then you can assume that model is better um, because the correspondence was good or that model is not so good because the correspondence was bad. So it's very hard to evaluate um, that step. So let's do some calculations with this correspondence assumption. And now for the smileys, I add the coordinate grid. So we now calculate with coordinates for the smileys. Those are 2D coordinates. For the 3D morph models, those are 3D coordinates. So for each point on the face, we have a 3D coordinate X, Y, Z, and um, we have a color an RGB color for each of the points on our 3D face. And once we have that, um, we have a representation that, um, which is in a format where we, where we can do some calculations. So for the smiley models, it's just an XY um, coordinate and we can do calculations like, for example, calculating um, the average face. So for the my, smiley model, we have a data set which has six smileys and we built all of them by hand. And then we can calculate the average. So we take all those six smileys, we take all the points, and for each of the value, values, we calculate the average. So we calculate the average of 0.1 and the x-coordinate, we calculate the average of 0.1, the y-coordinate, and then um, we just visualize that average, and what we get is this smiley um, you see on the, on the bottom right. And that's basically exactly what we also do with the 3D morph model. We take a data set, and what I'm showing here are the 10 publicly available faces from the Basel face model. The actual Basel face model is built from um, 200 3D face scans that are in dense correspondence. And there are also bigger um, 3D morph models. There is, for example, one that's built from 10,000 faces. But the concept for all of them is, is very similar. You take those faces 
and then you use them um, to do statistics. So the easiest statistic you can do is to calculate the average. So what you see here on the bottom is the average phase calculated from those 10 phases um, you see on top. And then besides the average, you would um, probably also like to um, visualize the variation that you get. The visualization, sorry, there is one step before I show you the visualization. So first of all, you need, you need to have the parametrization. So I told you before that we have the shape and the color parametrization. So we have X, Y, Z coordinates for each of those points. Those are around 65,000 points for the Basel phase model. And we have the same also for, for the RGB colors. We, and each of those values corresponds to, to one particular point. And you can look at those distributions. And this plot is actually taken from a paper where we say like, okay, this um, linear Gaussian model might not be the right one. So this is a particular distribution that we measure at the eye. Um, but for a lot of points in our data set to build the Basel phase model, the distribution is Gaussian or very close to Gaussian. For some points it's not, so for those points it might be better um, to use other modeling techniques. So we have a lot of those um, distributions per feature point, and then we can apply our favorite statistical method. Um, since most of our distributions are Gaussian, um, we use a Gaussian model and we just use principal component analysis for most experiments that I show you and almost everybody or a big part of the community um, still relies on simple PCA based model um, because they are low dimensional so it's easy to optimize in that space and um, they are linear that also makes a lot of things easier and of course there are nonlinear extensions they also have some benefits but I will show you later one example where you have a, a challenge, um, a 3D reconstruction challenge, and there the state-of-the-art models are actually not doing much more complicated things than um, what I'm showing you here on the on the modeling side. So this is how the how the 3D morphing model then looks like, and that's actually from the original paper um, from Blunt and Fetter, who proposed the 3D morphing model in, in 99. So what you see in the first row here is the visualization of the first three principal components um, in terms of shape variation. So those are the strongest um, shape variations in the data set. And the bottom three examples are the first three principal components um, of texture variation. You can see that there is also a little bit of illumination baked in here. And so different models will have slightly different um, first principal components. Um, but that's basically how you can imagine um, the different parameters of a 3D morphing model to work. To give you an idea of the dimensionality of, of this parameter space um, for the shape model and also for the texture model, um, if you have 200 examples, you get 199 parameters. Most people in practice use only the first 50 um, parameters. Those capture 99 point something percent of the variance. Um, so for most of the experiments, um, that's enough. Um, if you need a better model, then usually um, the number of parameters is not the limiting factor, but the expressiveness of, of the PCA model, because you can see in the texture model that a lot of the small details um, are missing, and they can also not be properly modeled if you just add more and more um, parameters to the model. So if we go back to our smiley model, and we go back to our task where we would like to do the manipulation. Um, if we take this representation point by point for the original image and we do our calculations of this happiness vector not, now not image based, so not pixel per pixel, but we do it point per point and only for those corresponding points, we can actually calculate this happiness vector. So we get a vector and we can apply that vector to the original image. And what we get from that um, is a manipulated image. So first of all, we get numbers and then we need a renderer. So we just render it in the same way as we render the other smileys. Um, but we, here we have to explicitly do it. And what we get is a smiley um, that applies exactly this happiness vector to the original image. What you can see here, it's not only the shape of the mouth changed, um, also the eyes moved down. Um, that's because in our happiness vector, um, the happiness seems not to be disentangled 
um, from the position of the eyes. So if you would like to find a good happiness vector, those two examples might just not be sufficient. We might actually need more examples um, to calculate this happiness vector, and I will show you how um, we can do that. So if you would have a lot of examples of people that are smiling or not smiling, and you somehow have this label, how strongly they are smiling, and you have the representation um, in, your, in your model space of all those examples, you can calculate this vector and then you can apply um, this vector to, um, to, your, to your model. And that's exactly um, what was also done with those um, vectors for perceived trustworthiness and that you have a lot of data that was labeled um, by humans and then you can estimate that vector and apply that vector um, on, on model instances. So if you'd, you would like to play around with those tools and play around with 3D morphing models. For both the Smiley model and also for the Basel face model, we have a model viewer and you can download the model. You can play around with those models. You can change um, the parameters, so the principal components to see what the strongest variations are. Um, you can, with the Smiley model, do those manipulations yourself, like the Smiley, the Smile vector is, is in there. And with the 3D morphing model, with the Basel face model, um, you have a separate color model, um, shape model, and an expression model where you can change the expressions um, on top of that. The expression model for the Basel face model is slightly different than those smile vectors. Those expressions are actually separate face captures where we then um, model the expression space as a deformation um, from, from the shape space. So this now helps us to understand how this portrait manipulation could work. Um, but there are still some very important components missing because we don't know yet how we get from this 2D image um, to this 3D morphing model. Because we can apply this um, smile vector or trustworthy vector on a 3D model instance, but what we get is a 2D image. So we somehow need to infer um, the 3D shape and the 3D texture from this 2D image. And that's also a task where various um, people spent their PhD on, and including me. I in particular looked at how we can solve that task um, if there is some occlusions. So there are various different techniques how we can try to estimate the 3D um, face shape from such a 2D image. And that's very important if we would like to manipulate um, this image with such a method. A project that I was recently involved in um, did do that um, to, with 3D morph models, but in combination um, with StyleGans, which is a 2D method for, for image generation. So the idea here was um, to use the, the photorealism capabilities um, of 2D StyleGans um, but to combine them with 3D morphing models. Because we have seen before that 3D morphing models have this challenge that they can't model the texture accurately. So this linear, simple PCA texture model might not be sufficient for a lot of applications. So if we want to do some complex changes on the images, we will need a more complex um, texture model. So in, in other words, the results that I've shown you before, where we, um, where we change one single 2D image, that works as long as we don't change too much of the texture. So if we only move around pixels, um, then it works. But if we want to also apply changes on the texture, then we need a method that enables us to synthesize textures. And this is, um, this is possible with this 3D uh, morphable style again that was um, built by Safa Medin. Um, he did an internship at Mitsubishi Electronics Research Lab. And um, I, I was very happy to be able to, to help him there. So if we go back to the image that I've shown you in the very beginning, um, you might remember that the task we had um, to reconstruct the 3D scene is actually pretty similar to what we need to do if we would like to reconstruct those 2D images for manipulation. So the input is a 2D image, and we would either like to understand the image, or we would like to understand um, 
sorry, we either would like to understand the image or we would like to apply a manipulation. But what we need for both of it, at least if we follow um, this approach, is that we um, reconstruct the 3D from this 2D image. So we would like to reconstruct a 3D face um, from this 2D image. And the way we do this um, is called inverse rendering. And what we need for inverse rendering um, is first to understand how rendering works. So for a lot of you, that might be very basic. Um, this is basic computer graphics. Um, it might be a bit special with our face model. So what our face model gives us is a shape model that you see here on the left. So we get a 3D shape that's just a simple mesh. Um, and on the right, we get a texture model, so we get a texture. And if you have a shape and a texture, you need two more things, and then you can get an image. One thing is you need a camera model. So in our case, we, we go with a simple pinhole camera model, um, which is not that unrealistic, but it's a pretty simple model. And we need um, an illumination model. And what we use here is a spherical harmonics illumination model. If you have never heard about spherical harmonics, the idea of spherical harmonics is to approximate the light that comes from the environment. And the nice thing about spherical harmonics is that it gives you a low dimensional um, representation of this environment map. So you get 27 parameters um, that explain basically the illumination in, in the scene. And it has been shown that for um, diffuse reflectance, those 27 parameters are, are pretty much sufficient. We have a very recent um, work currently on archive um, that shows that if you use a neural representation, um, you can build more powerful illumination priors um, with 27 parameters. And that is especially valuable um, if you also would like to take specular reflections into account. And even on faces, you might also see it on my forehead now, and there are some specular reflections, so that might also be important um, if you want to do inverse rendering of faces. So what you get if you have all those parameters is a rendering of a 2D face. And this here is a synthetic face that we render on the bottom. And if we would like to do inverse rendering, what we have to do is basically go the opposite way. So we take the 2D face as an input, and we would like to infer all the other parameters. So given this 2D input, we would like to know where is the camera, what is the illumination condition, what is the texture, and what's the 3D shape. And this is an ill-posed problem. And it's ill-posed because there are multiple possible solutions. You might know that if you, if you do a selfie with a camera, um, your face sometimes looks distorted. And if you want to solve the inverse problem, you don't really know if this distortion comes from the camera projection or if this distortion is actually that that person has that shape. Um, so that's the ambiguity between the camera and the shape. Um, you also have another ambiguity with, um, with the texture and the illumination because some, um, some appearance of faces you can explain with both the texture of the face or the illumination condition. So a slight change um, in, in skin tone you could also just explain um, by an illumination variation. So there are some ambiguities, it's an ill-posed problem and what you need to solve this ill-posed problem is a very strong statistical prior. And that's exactly what the 3D morphin model delivers us here for, for this application. What we need is we need to know how do faces look like. So what is a likely, um, what is a likely setup um, for the scene? And once we have those priors, um, we can use them to solve this ill-posed problem. And in our case, we have priors on the shape, we have priors on the texture, and we have priors on the illumination conditions, and we even have some very simple um, camera priors like almost all the faces are somehow facing you. If you see my head from the back, you don't have any face. So then it's not important for us anymore. So our camera prior assumes that the face always is in somehow a pose up till um, 90 degrees. And of course, we don't want to solve that problem for synthetic faces. We would like to solve that problem for real world faces. The person I'm showing here, by the way, all the time is um, Sandro Schönborn. 
Um, I did my PhD in the same lab as Sandro Schönborn, and he was basically co-supervising me during um, my PhD. So that's why you see his face um, here very frequently. So this slide here is again um, over 20 years old. It's from the original presentation of the 3D model model at SIGGRAPH. So you have the input image and you would like to generate a synthetic image here um, next to the input image. And you would like to adopt it in a way that it looks very close to the input image. And the first thing you need to do is you need to detect where the face is and then you have to adapt all those parameters. So you have to find the post parameters, those are the camera parameters, you have to find the illumination condition and you have to find those shape model parameters um, or the, the morphine model parameters which are here depicted with alpha and beta. So you need to find which linear combination um, of faces you need to regenerate this input image. And there are a lot of parameters. So for the pose, illumination and shape and texture parameters, um, you have easily like 200 parameters that you have to optimize at the same time. The really tricky ones um, are especially the pose, um, because if you don't get the pose right, um, everything else doesn't make any sense. So you need some, some strong inference techniques. In the original paper, they initialized the pose by hand, and you even saw the hand in the video before. Um, in later work today, you have um, strong landmark detectors or also direct um, pose regressions. What you get out at the end, if you solve this um, optimization problem, is a reconstruction of the face. So you get a 3D model of the face. And what you can do with that um, is what we have done before. You can do the manipulation. You can re-render the face under different illumination conditions and you get you get the 3D model so you could also use it for, for other applications and you can rotate it, whatever. So here I would just quickly like to show you the full pipeline um, to, to do one of those image manipulations. And that's a short video and the text is in German, sorry for, sorry for that. Um, so the first thing we have to do is we have to find the face. We did that with the face detector. Then we start this inference process. And what we used here as an inference technique is Markov chain in Monte Carlo. Um, so it's a sampling based approach and we are slowly converting to the face. You can see that we adapt the illumination, the shape and the texture. At the end, um, we have a pretty good reconstruction. We blend in the real texture and then we can um, rotate the face. We have a 3D reconstruction. Um, that we can visualize and use um, for, for various applications, um, including the image manipulation. So if we go back to this image, we could of course also apply everything that you've seen um, on this image. I spare you the uh, manipulation, I also honestly didn't do that, but we can run the 3D reconstruction for all the faces in that image. And you might, it might be very hard to see now um, what the reconstruction is and what the image is because it's overlaid. So let's remove the image. And I would hope that all of you agree that in this representation, this representation is much more rich than if we just say this is a face or this is a segmentation of a face or this is a segmentation of a body or those are the labels of the face. So the goal here is really to get a rich um, understanding of the scene. You can also see some biases of our model in this reconstruction. Um, the model was built in the model that we are using here is the Basel face model. It was built in Switzerland and almost everybody in the model um, who was scanned was a student at the University of Basel. That means we have a very strong bias to um, people that walk around in Switzerland and um, to young participants. So that's why you can see here that especially the older folks um, are not very well reconstructed. So this whole idea of modeling shapes that way um, is even older than 20 years. It's over 100 years old. And that's a pretty nice book from Darcy Thompson um, where he describes how you can model things that you can see in nature. And one example he has, you might have seen in, in shape modeling courses, um, is this example with the fish, where he basically says like a lot of fish are just deformation of other fishes. So you take a fish and you apply some kind of non-rigid deformation and what you get is a new type of fish. So he said like a lot of the fish that, that are around you can explain by deforming other fish. 
If you dig a little bit deeper into the book, and I would actually recommend all of you to, to dig around in that book, um, it's publicly available and it has some beautiful um, work in there. Um, you can also see much more complex models for other things that you can observe in nature. So it has a lot of very nice visualizations and um, it also has um, statistical models of dinosaurs. So I got recently very excited about dinosaurs and this, book's, this book also covers that. Um, and it also has um, some applications that perhaps go more in a medical direction. So the Morphin model that you've seen before um, is very similar to statistical shape models. And those are used in a lot of um, medical applications where you, where you want to model um, bones or where you want to model skulls um, for reconstruction purpose, for example. Um, so a lot of, of what's covered um, in this book um, is also covered by statistical models, how they are today um, used, especially for medical applications. So since those 3D morphing models are over 20 years old, um, two or three years ago, we, a group of people met at a Dutchel seminar. And one result of that Dutchel seminar is that some of us, um, 13 here, um, put our heads together and, and wrote a survey paper about 3D morphing models. And the idea of that survey paper was to, to really cover widely what happened in this last 20 years. Because a lot of the things that I told you before are things that were actually already in there in the initial paper or in some variants in there in the original paper. And of course, there was a lot of research done in between. So we have over 300 references in that paper. Um, and we kind of structured that somehow um, we made tables to, to show um, what things are publicly available, which models you can just download, um, which data sets um, are available, which inference methods are available, which registration techniques are available. Um, so there are also plenty of tables in there, um, but the, really the main idea is to give you a, a very broad overview over all the different topics um, that are involved in building the models and using the models. And I just want to give you a brief overview over what's covered in that survey paper because it shows um, how wide um, 3D morphing models are and how many small challenges are involved when you want models. So the first challenge is the capture. So we need some kind of data. Today we have morphing models that are built on 2D data. But in terms of quality, they are just not the same as the morphing models that are built from 3D data. So capture setups today look something like the two on the right. So the image that you see on the top, that's a light stage. And this is a light stage that was built in academia by Will Smith in, in York. And there are also now commercially available light stages um, that fill whole rooms. Um, and at the bottom, you can see um, a capture setup from industry, from Disney Research. Um, which also enables um, capture of, of emotions and motions um, and this is highly um, photorealistic. So dynamic capture is a whole different challenge. Um, and here you can see that the eyes are closed and that has a re reason, like capturing eyes is just a very um, hard problem. Today, we are lucky that not everybody has to build such a sophisticated capture setup um, because there are a lot of shared data sets. Of course, sometimes it's not exactly what you need, um, but very often it's just much more easy to use one of those data sets than um, to build your own. There are still a lot of remaining challenges because almost all those captures, at least the 3D data, are captured under lab conditions. Those setups are very expensive, so you need to buy expensive um, equipment and you also need to have space to actually put them. Um, modeling expressions is pretty tricky. And there are also some ethical challenges because um, the data that you capture is what your model is later built on. So that basically defines in, in which direction your model will be biased. And it also has some privacy implications um, because all the faces that you capture are, are real world people here. Um, so that's something we have to think about when we, when we collect data and when we make data publicly available. On the modeling side, then, I've shown you the most simple um, principal component analysis-based models. 
Um, so what we have today is some models are based on a UV representation, some models are mesh based, um, very recent models are also implicit models, um, which are learned representations. Um, there, in the original paper, there was no modeling of the of facial expressions. There are now also for facial expressions, linear models, nonlinear models, um, models that, that, that model facial expressions in a statistical way or with blend shapes. Um, some models have this very strong correspondence assumptions, assumption. Some models um, also break or challenge this very strong correspondence assumption. And today we also have models that are shared. So on the right here you see um, some of the publicly available 3D morphic face models, some are only shape models, others provide a shape and texture and also expression model. So there is a wide variety um, of different models that are available to you if, you if you would like to use them today. Also on the modeling side, there are quite some challenges. Um, if you have seen the captures before and you looked at the renderings that I've shown you, there is a pretty large gap between what we can capture and what we can model. And that's even the case if you use the most fancy um, nonlinear GAN based texture representation. There is just a huge gap um, between what you get in a high quality capture setup to what we can model in a model that has a, a low dimensional parametric representation. Some parts of the face are particularly hard to capture. So for example, eyes, mouth and hair um, for all different kinds of reasons. One is um, the physics of the scanner. Um, hair is also very hard to represent in a lot of representations, for example, in the mesh-based one. Um, and the mouth is sometimes closed, sometimes open, but it's just very hard to somehow model the interior of the mouth. Another challenge is the interpretability of the resulting latent space. So for a PCA model, you at least know it's the biggest, uh, the direction of the biggest variation. And with deep models, the interpretability um, doesn't get better. And as I told you before, with the data, um, every model will be biased. So um, understanding those biases and being aware of those biases when building applications is very important. The next thing then is, is rendering, so the image formation. How can we generate 2D images from those 3D morphing models? Um, so today we have much more complicated illumination models than we used 20 years ago. So 20 years ago in the original morph model paper they used a point light source. Today I already told you spherical harmonics are very popular, um, but there are definitely also more um, complex illumination models and, and people are also thinking about um, including not only diffuse reflection but also spectral reflection like you see here on the right. That's the first publicly available um, model that gives you a diffuse and uh, a specular albedo. And the data here was captured with the light stage that you have just seen before. Today we also have differentiable renders. That's actually a fun fact that the 3D morphal model paper from 99 used a differentiable render and stochastic gradient descent. So we didn't change that much um, when it comes to differentiable renders here, except that today they are much more accessible and there are huge toolkits and they're also available to everybody and um, not only the authors. Like in 99, it was just not so common um, to share the, the resulting source code. And um, a lot of the rendering today is also focusing on animation and not only um, still images. But also on the um, image formation um, side, there are a lot of remaining ch challenges. So for example, this pinhole camera model is, is not too bad, but it's also not um, very exact. Um, then not everything in the rendering process is, uh, is differentiable. And again, um, we have the realism gap. So it's not only the model that limits the realism, it's also the rendering um, that, that limits the realism here. The next topic in the survey paper is then analysis by synthesis. So, that, so that's the part that I showed you before where we would like to do the 3D reconstruction from the 2D image. And this is basically a computer vision application. Um, so there are a lot of different methods how to do that. And you find a table in the paper that says like that method does that with, with that idea. Um, and the state of the art methods are, are also highly enabled by having not just one single loss function, like in the example that I showed you, we just try to 
um, minimize the distance between the input image and the reconstruction, but a collection of losses. So also perceptual loss, um, face recognition loss, um, a loss on the prior for regularization. So it's a huge um, collection of different loss functions and that seems to, to work best. A lot of focus um, in the community is putting on shape it's been put on shape. So a lot of the papers that you see out there are actually not reconstructing um, the texture at all. Um, at the same time, a lot of the code that's published today um, comes with shared code. And there is even a challenge. And what you see here on the right is um, the now challenge. So the idea is you get 2D images and your task is to do this 3D reconstruction. And what they did to, to enable this challenge is they have 3D scans of the same people as they have 2D pictures from. So you can compare the reconstructions against the ground truth and then measure how um, well you reconstruct those methods. So what you see here now on the right is one of the um, state of the art methods that does that 3D reconstruction um, with a lot of um, details and um, goes down to almost a millimeter, millimeter um, in, in shape distance. So there are some open challenges also here. So for example, the benchmark this now challenge is only interested in shape. We don't look at texture at all. So this benchmark doesn't care about how well um, the algorithms reconstruct the textures. Um, there are also a lot of ambiguities and those ambiguities I told you before is what we need the strong priors for. Um, but some of those ambiguities are, are even not 100% understood um, how, how we could resolve them. Um, that's, for example, te texture and illumination, um, the camera uh, projector and the shape, or also an ambiguity between identity and expression parameters. Yeah. So um, then we have a, a particular chapter in the survey paper about deep learning, because of course deep models had a, had a pretty big impact and basically all of the different parts of morphine model, model, models, but we decided to have a separate section um, to list all those impacts and, and somehow state why they are so important. So especially for nonlinear models, um, deep methods are, are highly valuable. Um, you can build joint models, for example, for faces and speech. Um, deep methods are also heavily used for the inverse rendering task. Um, mainly enabled by those um, differentiable renders that are now available in PyTorch and all the other frameworks. Um, they're used to learn models, so also to learn 3D models from 2D observations, and I will show you an example of that later, um, or also to build implicit models where we are not um, having this strong correspondence assumption and where we don't, um, where, where we are not limited by, by a mesh-based um, representation. The, the example you can hear, see here is, for example, one of those deep reconstruction methods. And what's particularly strong about this one is, is the speed. So before deep learning, there was just no method um, that could reach um, that accuracy in that short amount of time um, for reconstruction. Um, and, and that's definitely enabled um, by those fast um, inference techniques. What you see here is now um, an implicit morphine model. So you can see that it's now not only the face that's modeled, but also hair. Um, hair was usually not modeled because it's very hard to model hair with a mesh-based representation. And um, it's also very hard um, to capture hair and it's very hard to model hair, um, especially when you assume um, strong correspondence. And there are also different beard styles so mainly the, the correspondence assumption in that model is not as strict as in the classical morph model. There are also on deep learning side um, several open challenges. So if you approach any of those tasks in a learning based way, you always also run in the risk of overfitting to that particular distribution. And one core strength of those simple linear models is they are pretty strong when it comes to generalization. And you lose some of that benefit if you you, you use learning-based methods um, that are kind of more limited to what they observe um, in the training data. So for extrapolation for out-of-distribution generalization, 
um, I think the, the classical linear models are, are very often stronger. Another open challenge is that for a lot of those techniques you need a lot of training data, so we would like to use um, less data and that's um, again something if you just build a simple linear model, um, 50 phase scans are, are plenty. If you want to build a deep model, um, you definitely need more. Then the model building side, you still need high quality data or you need a lot of data. So one of the key tasks um, or key hopes here, I think, would be that we could build stronger models um, from 2D data that's just much um, more available in, in the internet, for example. Um, last but not least, I would like to talk about different applications, and there are some applications that are more obvious to use, some applications are perhaps less obvious. So 3D morphin models um, are, are heavily used for, for entertainment purpose. Um, they were used also for face recognition applications. I'm not sure if that's still today the case, but one of the tasks that 3D morphin models are, for example, helpful um, almost 20 years ago was if you want to go from a front view to a side view, um, that's probably today just solved with a lot of data and, and large networks. Then there are also forensic applications, um, like the one that I've shown in the very beginning, if you would like to reconstruct the skull um, at the face from the skull or vice versa, or um, if you would um, like to have, um, uh, how are you called, the pictures that the police shows you if that was the same person, there were also some projects in that um, direction. Then there are various medical applications. I actually have um, an example here. So for reconstructive surgery, um, imagine you would like to reconstruct a nose for a person that's missing a nose. And then the statistical model is very helpful to be able to provide a nose that fits the face and is not catching um, too much attention if you would like to avoid that. And um, the 3D morphin models are also heavily used to study the human visual system, um, especially to see if face processing um, is somehow doing something statistical and also some inverse rendering based methods. For all those different parts of 3D morphine models, and that's also something we covered in the, in the survey paper, that there are some challenges that are shared. There are challenges that show up in all those different um, directions. One of those challenges is um, that we would like to have a low dimensional model for the inverse rendering problem because the more parameters we add, the more the harder it gets to solve the inverse rendering problem um, versus the degree of detail. With all the parameters we add, we gain details. Um, so it's kind of a trade off um, what details we get and how, how much parameters we have. Another challenge is how to compare the results. So in a lot of papers, um, what you will see to compare the results, uh, you will see a, a quantitative evaluation. And very often it's just a quantitative evaluation because it's very hard to provide numbers. And some of the numbers that are in papers in our community are just not really helpful, but those are the only numbers that we can deliver. So the, the comparison and benchmark is definitely a huge challenge and some of that um, the problem is not actually that you couldn't measure it. The problem is that the data is not available or not easy to get where you could measure it. Um, another challenge is that if we would like to go beyond faces, so if we would like to apply some of those modeling techniques on other objects, um, like for example tables or chairs or cars, um, there are currently big parts of the computer vision community trying to do exactly that, and there you don't have this um, strong correspondence assumption. But at the same time, the in the wild inverse rendering problem is not working as well as, as um, it's tuned here for this faces application. And as I mentioned before, there are some ethical challenges um, with regards to the data, the capture, the model building, um, but also the various applications that you can imagine that you can build um, on top of such models. At the end of the paper, we then also try to imagine how the future could look like. Um, so how representations in the future could look like, how we could break some of the modeling assumptions, um, how we could get rid of a lot of the manual work that's still today put into building high quality 3D morphine models. And then if there is actually one model that can fill all the applications 
or if we need models that are specific for some applications. So for some applications, we might need the photorealism. And for other applications, it might be much more important that we have a low dimensional representation. The current trends in computer vision are definitely very helpful um, when it comes to 3D model models because 3D modeling, inverse rendering, and all those implicit representation ideas um, are all something that I believe will, will push 3D model models um, way beyond what they are um, today. So now I would just like to show you um, some additional ideas um, on top of this classical morphing model. And now the, the things that I show you are even more biased towards the research that I was involved in than everything before. So most of the results you see now um, I, I was directly involved in. So when we build a 3D morphing model, that's again the data from Basel. Um, what I've shown you before is building a model from shape and texture. And what we na do now is we also include some attributes, like here age, height, weight, and sex. So those are the attributes that were collected when the scans were collected. And what you need to be able to in um, include those attributes is you need a, a method um, that's somehow able to deal with shape, texture, and attributes in the same model. The method we were using here is coupler component analysis. It's a very simple extension of principal component analysis that basically separates the marginal distribution, which can be continuous, it can be categorical, it can be binary. Um, it separates this marginal distribution from the dependency structure, and that enables you to throw everything together in one model. And what you get is a model that not only contains shape and texture, like before shape and texture were modeled separately, now it's a joint model, and um, it also contains attributes. And we use that model on the one side to build a face model where we could, for example, um, constrain the model on a subpopulation. So we call this a patient-specific model because we were thinking of medical applications here. So you could say, give me the posterior model of male at a certain age and you would get the model that's built on your whole data set, um, but conditioned on those attributes that you give the model. And we also explored that for a really medical application, that's one thing that I also showed you in the very beginning of the presentation, um, when we were modeling those lateral ventricles of the brain. We here had um, also some attributes um, like the age or the sex, and then some um, stroke related attributes. Um, so if they have hypertension, if they smoke, and then those four numbers, which are some kind of stroke outcome scores. And we basically looked how strongly those attributes correlate with the shape of the ventricles and also with um, the de degree of hypertension in that direction on the surface normal of the ventricle, which is here visualized in color. And you can see that there is, there is quite some variation. Um, on the very left, you see the unconditioned model, where we have the average ventricle with the average um, white matter hyperintensity. And then we have the first degree of variation. If we condition the model on male, um, it looks very similar. If we condition the model on 80 years old, you see that the ventricles are bigger um, and that there are more white matter hyperintensity. So the intensity of the red is a bit stronger. Um, if you take a much younger person and the female one, um, the ventricles will be smaller than in the old per person. And also the hyperintensities are something that correlates very strongly with age. So you see that there are almost no hyperintensities in, in this young female um, population. The, the really cool thing here is that the model is always built on the full data set. We only condition it on those attributes. So you can build a model on a combination of attributes where you don't have a single training point. So if I would say like male 37, 80 kilogram smoker um, hypertension, I would get the distribution of the remaining flexibility given those attributes. And I would even get that if I have no single training data that fulfills those attributes. And that's, I think, the strengths of that model. Um, then there are various different medical applications. Um, that's actually an application which one was one of the first projects I was involved here at FAU from Maximilian Weyer, who is a PhD student here. Um, he built this model um, back when he did his master's at Regensburg. 
Um, so he had a collection of breast scans and there are some very different challenges when you when you model breasts and then when you model faces. So for a face you have a lot of features and um, for breasts this correspondence assumption is very tricky and it's very um, challenging to establish this correspondence and you would also like to um, disentangle the variation of the breast from the variation of the torso because it's also very hard um, to, to scan breasts. So he built the first um, publicly available breast model um, which has of course um, several interesting uh, medical applications um, that, that are now to be built because the model is, is pretty new. Another um, application I'm involved in is actually more related to this inverse rendering setup. So if you have a 2D image, you can reconstruct a 3D face and you can reconstruct it pretty accurately. So this could also in a medical um, setting enable some diagnosis that are not enabled yet. And doing a diagnosis based on the face um, is, a, is a very tricky topic, but there are um, diseases or syndromes where the diagnosis is classically done on the face. And fetal alcohol syndrome is one of those, like the facial characteristics are one of the things that are used to do the diagnosis. And so the, the model we, or the method we are trying to build here is um, a method that would give you um, a score based on a 2D image of the face. It has been shown that if you have the 3D scan, you can predict the same attributes as the doctors would note down um, pretty accurately. Um, but the challenge is that a 3D scanner is not something that every one of us has at home. So if we could enable that um, with a simple unconstrained camera, um, it would be much, much, much easier. This project was done together um, with Professor Tina Shemutswanga at the University of Cape Town and Felix Atuer um, from Uganda, who did his master thesis on this. I told you before that there is this now challenge. And when I prepared this slide here, um, Chun Lu Li, um, who is a PhD student who was visiting Thomas Petter um, in Basel, who I had the pleasure to co-advise together with Alan Kortilevsky, um, scored on rank one on this now challenge. So what she did is she implemented a method that combines um, ideas from, from classical inference with um, modern learning-based techniques. The key thing that she changed is to make it occlusion aware. So to decide for each pixel if we should adapt the model to that pixel or if we should not adapt the model to that pixel. So the paper is called to fit or not to fit. So for each pixel, we have to decide if we should fit that pixel or if it's, if it's some kind of, of occlusion. And with this um, simple but powerful idea, um, she outperformed the state of the art that you have seen before that had all those details um, with a simple PCA-based um, morphine model. So there is nothing nonlinear going on um, on the modeling side here. Um, today, if you go to this Now Challenge webpage, we are not on rank one anymore. So this screenshot was taken somewhere in March. Um, I, I don't have the truth of that on, on my slides, um, but we are not rank one anymore. And there is now another other method that scores even better. And that method is, however, um, using supervision. So Chun Lu's method is still the best unsupervised method on the Now Challenge if you do the non-metrical evaluation. Another project I'm um, involved in is together with Skylar Sutherland. Um, she was a research assistant together with me at MIT, and she's now a PhD student um, in Yale. And the basic idea of this project was um, to just assume that the human brain has some kind of a 3D morphine model. And if we go with that assumption that we have somehow a 3D morphine model in our brain and we use an inverse graphics pipeline to solve our vision tasks, the question is how can we acquire such a 3D morphine model? And 3D scans is definitely not something we have access to. So the very basic idea of this project is to throw away all the training data and to learn the models and do it in some kind of a self-learning way. So let's throw away all training data. Um, so what do we have to build in? What do we have to build into an infant that they can learn a 3D morphine model 
um, of phases during development. So we built a computational model um, to show that if we only built in an average phase, we could learn such a model. So what we build in is an inverse graphics pipeline, an average phase, and a very simple method to generate some random phases. So what you see here um, are some random deformations in shape space, in texture space. So we can generate a lot of images and they're not realistic phases, but we can generate those images and we can train a face detector on it. Um, so that's exactly what we did. We train a face detector on it and we do um, an initial fitting. So we fit this model that we built from that very weird data and fit it to do the images. And what was pretty striking is that those reconstructions look pretty good. Of course, the, the 3D shape that we get from them are definitely not perfect, but the reconstructions look pretty good. So the idea then was, let's start with this CNN reconstruction, but somehow we need to escape that space of this very simplistic model. So what we did next is a Markov chain Monte Carlo based inference. That's that we get the generalization that we can escape the space of what the CNN is trained on. Um, and we built on those final fitting results from MCMC a new model. And the tricky part or the key how we made it work is that we need some kind of quality control at every step. After the initial fit, we have to decide if that was successful or if it went wrong. After fitting the generative model, we have to ex again check if what we get as a fitting result is anything close to the image or not. Because if we include something in our model and build a new model that has some crappy shapes in there, um, it doesn't work. So this, this quality control um, has to be very conservative and has to make sure that no wrong reconstruction ends up in there. And what we end up with is um, a 3D morphing model that has some of the basic statistic properties as the model that we get from 3D scans. Um, but of course, the, the quality um, doesn't yet reach um, the quality that we would get um, from 3D scans. What I like in particular about that method, there are also other methods that have similar ideas, is that this one here really uses very minimal data and it doesn't use anything that's pre-trained on other data. Every other method that tries to build a 3D morphing model from 2D data uses either pre-trained landmark detection networks or face recognition networks as loss function or whatever. We don't use any other data to train this model than um, around 100 2D face images and the 3D um, template face that I show you here, the average face. So after all of that I've shown you, I would also like to acknowledge all the awesome people I had the pleasure to work with. Um, on the right, you see um, my group that I did my PhD in um, from the University of Basel. And all the other faces are mainly people that I later met in my career during my stay at MIT or collaborators all around the world. Some of them I have only seen via Zoom um, and also some first people that I um, started to work here um, at FIU and of course my family. Thank you very much um, for your attention. And as promised, I should be here virtually um, to answer all of your questions. Thank you very much.